This is Getting to Know Your Bible, a program dedicated to the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's Billy Lambert. We have people watching Getting to Know Your Bible literally all over the world. In all 50 of the United States and in over 100 countries of the world. I've been told 170 countries of the world. Those who watch Getting to Know Your Bible, regardless of where you may be, where you may live, have one thing in common. We all know what it means to hurt. Yes, indeed, we all know what it means to hurt. We want to talk about today a man who hurt and what God did for that man and how that relates to us today. Stay tuned as we discuss this topic, the end of the Lord. Now, in getting to know your Bible, we offer a free Bible correspondence course, and I emphasize the course is free. We want you to have it in order that you might know more about the course and that you might know how to receive it. Let's pause for just a moment. To help you in your study of the Bible, we want to send you this Bible correspondence course. This course is non-denominational. It's based on the Bible. It's conducted by mail, and it's free. To receive this course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama, 36580, or call toll-free 1-877-711-5214. I'm going to be reading to you today from the book of James, chapter 5, and I'm going to be reading verse 11. James, chapter 5, and verse 11. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate compassionate and merciful. A number of years ago, I was preaching in uh, Mississippi, northern, northern Mississippi, and I was staying in the city of Corinth, Mississippi. There was a friend of mine who was the preacher for the church there, one of the churches in Corinth, and he called me one day to see if I would uh, like to have lunch with he and his wife in their new home. And I accepted the invitation. I don't know of many preachers staying in a motel that would turn down an invitation for home-cooked food. And so I went to their home, to Charles and Dot's home, and we, they were so delighted to, for me to be there, and I felt so comfortable and so welcome. And they told me this is the first home that they had ever owned. They'd always lived in one owned by the church. And after we had a delicious meal, we sat down to talk for a while, and, and I remember they sat together in a little love seat. And above their heads was a picture of a beautiful young woman. That was their daughter. And they began to tell me about their daughter, that she had gone on a date with a young man. They were going to a football game, and there was a light rain, and that boy's car slid off the road, went off the road into a ditch, and she was killed. And that had only been a few months prior to that. He had to take me out to see the place where his daughter had died. And that was a very moving visit for me, very moving experience for me. Little did I know that visiting in that home that day would prepare me for the time that I would lose not only a daughter, but I would lose a grandson as well. The fact is, all people are going to experience difficulties in their life. Regardless of who they are, where they are, how, what uh, their status may be in life, they're going to have some kind of problems. No one is exempt. Job 5 and verse 7 says that man is born under trouble as the sparks fly upward. 
And that used to puzzle me about what that really meant. But then it occurred to me that the sparks always fly up from the fire. And just as certainly as the sparks fly up from the fire, it's just that certain that a person is going to have trouble in this life. In the 14th chapter of Job, verse number 1, Job said, Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. So all we have just a few days on this earth compared to eternity. But one of the things that we can be certain of that in those few days that we have, that we're going to have some trouble in our lives, some difficulty in our lives, some hurt. The Apostle Paul knew what it was to have uh, problems and difficulties and to hurt. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8, Paul said that we are troubled on every side. Can, can you imagine having trouble everywhere you turn on every side? Why, he said we are not distressed, however. He said we're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We are persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We are cast down, but we are not destroyed. I like to summarize what Paul said by saying he was knocked down, but he was not knocked out. Paul knew what it meant to suffer. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in tw verse 24, he said, uh, Of the Jews, three times was I stoned. Uh, I, I, and, and then three times was I beaten with rods. Once was I in a shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. He said, I've been in journeyings often. And I've been in perils in the wilderness, in the city. I've been in perils among false brethren. I, he said, everywhere I have turned, there's been some kind of problem. Paul went on to say that he's been in cold and in nakedness often. Paul knew what it was to suffer for just the necessities of life. But in spite of that, in the verse 28, he said that which comes upon me daily, the care of all of the churches. In spite of all of his problems, Paul wasn't concerned about Paul. Paul suffered, and Paul came out a winner. Another man that really suffered greatly was a man by the name of Job. Job experienced some crushing blows in his life. Think about Job for just a moment. Job was a real historical character. Job lived during the patriarchal age of Bible history. Job lived in the land of Uz. This is southeast of Palestine, down near the Dead Sea. Now think about the character of Job. When you think about his character, it is unquestioned. As a matter of fact, his character is unquestionable. The Bible describes him in Job chapter 1 as a man who was upright, as a man who feared God, as a man who turned from evil. And he's also described later on in this book as a very benevolent-minded man. Listen to Job chapter 1 and verse number 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Then in Job chapter 28 and 12, he said, I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper. Job was a man who was of sterling character. But also think about the wealth of this man. He was a very wealthy man. He had 7,000 sheep. Can you imagine trying to keep up with 7,000 sheep? And then he said, I had 3,000 camels. Imagine 3,000 camels. That's 10,000 animals right there that Job owns that he has to keep up with. Then he had 500 yoke of oxen. He had uh, 500 donkeys. And he had servants by the dozen. In the standards of the world in that day, Job was a very wealthy man. Wealthy. 
But Job also had a very large family. Job had seven sons, and he had three daughters. That's in verse 2 of chapter 1. So he had a large family. Can you imagine having that many children today? I know of a family that has that many children. They have ten children. Big family. And then he had prestige. According to Job chapter 1 and 3, he was the greatest of all of the people of the East. But, but his life was turned upside down. Have you ever had your life turned upside down by trouble? Well, he had his turned upside down because it was filled with trouble. In Job chapter 1, verses 13 and 19 is a description of what happened in Job's life, that there was a time that all of his sons and the daughters were eating and drinking at the eldest brother's house. And there was a messenger who came to Job, and he told them that all, while the donkeys and the oxen were feeding, uh, that the Sabaeans came and took them and killed all of his servants. Now that's a crushing blow in and of itself. And then there was fire that fell from heaven and killed all of the sheep and then the servants that were tending the sheep. And then the Chaldeans came and they took all of those camels that he had, all 3,000 of his camels, and killed the servants. And then while the sons and daughters were in the eldest, oldest brother's home eating and drinking, there was a great wind that came and it destroyed the house, and it killed all of Job's children. You know, it's terrible to lose a child, one child. But, but can you conceive, can you begin to imagine the pain that he experienced by losing all of his children, all ten of them? He lost it all. He lost his wealth. He lost his family. I don't know of anything that's more precious to us than our family, our children, our wives, our husbands, and to lose it all, to lose it, had to be such a crushing blow to Job. Now, Job learned to cope with his losses. How did he cope? You know what many people would have done in a situation like Job found himself? They would have started pointing a finger at God. They would have started blaming God for what was going on in their life. In Judges chapter 6 and verse 13, here's a question that is asked. If the Lord be for us, why then, why then is all of this befallen us? Now, to put it in just a different way, if God is on our side, why is God allowing all of this to happen? I could not begin to tell you in the years that I've been a preacher, the times that I have been asked by a family, why did this happen, Brother Lambert? Can, can you tell me why a baby died? Can, can you tell me why my husband left me? Can you tell me why my children have turned out the way they have? Why? Well, let me say, first of all, that it's not wrong to ask why. It is not wrong. Even Jesus asked the question, why? You remember when Jesus was on the cross, he, he said, Why have you forsaken me? Now, when Job suffered all of these losses, his friends began to gather around. And the book of Job is just a series of debates or a series of uh, speeches that were made by Job and his friends. Now, some of Job's friends made this accusation against Job. Job, you must have done something terribly wrong, or all of these things would not be happening to you. Oh, they were wrong about that. They were wrong. And then here comes Job's wife. The, the one person that should have been encouraging Job, the one person that should have been holding up his arms in support, and she comes to, them and, to him and she says, Honey, won't you just curse God and die? Get out of all your misery. Just do that. 
Now, can you imagine a man going through all of that? What did Job do? How did he react? Well, Job said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked I will return. We didn't bring anything into the world. We'll carry nothing out of the world. If Paul put it like this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, that, that we brought nothing into the world, and it is certain we'll take, take nothing out. You're not going to take a U-Haul behind your hearse. You're not going to take anything with you when you leave. And then Job said, The Lord giveth. The Lord giveth. The Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of this, Job said not nor charge God foolishly. But Job just worshiped God. That's how Job responded. Well, somebody says, you know, but Billy, I'm not Job. I'm not Job. How, how am I supposed to respond? Well, I think that's a fair question. And one of the things that I would suggest to you that when something happens to you and puts you into deep, deep sorrow, pain in your heart that is so terrible that you can hardly stand it, grieve. Just express your grief. Jesus expressed his grief when he was on the cross. He expressed his grief when he came to the house of Lazarus. We're told that he groaned within his spirit. And Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus wept. When David had a child to die, David wept over the death of that child. And then David said, I'll go to him. He'll not come to me. And when his son Absalom died, he wept. He said, oh, Absalom, my son, my son, would to God I died for thee. His heart was broken. Express your grief. Don't hold it in. If you were to put a tea kettle on a, on a hot stove and the tea kettle was filled with water and the tea kettle had no escape valve, what would happen to that tea kettle? Well, eventually it would explode. It has to have a release valve to let the pressure off. And unless we have a release valve, when uh, grief comes our way, and sorrow sweeps over our soul, then we're not going to be able to handle life as well as we ought. Express your grief. And another suggestion that I would make when sorrow comes is to uh, stay close to God. And may I say that sorrow can come from a lot of sources. It can come because you've lost your job. It can cause because you've got a bad report from the doctor. Sorrow can come because you've had problems at home. Sorrow can come because of hundreds of things. Maybe you've lost someone that you love. You see, losses are of two kinds, things and people. And when we suffer a loss, then, then what do we do? Well, I suggest that you stay close to God. Get as close to Him as you can. Isn't that good advice? James 4 and 8 says, Draw near God. He will draw near to you. So the closer you try to get to God, the closer God gets to you. Isn't that a wonderful thing to, to contemplate? You say, well, Brother Lambert, how am I going to do that? Well, won't you let God talk to you? You say, well, now, how's God going to talk to me? I, I occasionally hear some man on television talking about God speaking to him, and he means that God came in the middle of the night and spoke to him directly and said thus and so to him. People, the way God speaks to us today is through his word. He speaks to us through his word today. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets had in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. And whatever Jesus tells us, whatever the Holy Spirit has revealed in the New Testament is God talking to us. 
When we study the Old Testament, that's inspired of God and God's speaking to us. Why don't you just let God talk to you through His Word? In other words, read the Bible. Read the Bible. As, as Isaiah put it in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. And then another thing you do in drawing close to God is you talk to God. You let Him talk to you, then you talk to Him. You say, what do you mean talk to Him? Well, pray. Prayer. Someone says, I don't know how to pray. Do you know how to talk to anyone? You say, well, yes. God is your Father. God is your Heavenly Father. And just as you would like to hear from your children, He wants to hear from His. And He's promised that if we will ask, we'll receive. That if we seek, we will find. If we knock unto us, it will be opened. And that God is willing to give good things unto all of them that ask Him. James 4 and 2 says, You have not because you ask not. Now, when trouble comes in your life, why, why don't you rely on people that love you? Why, why don't you rely on the comfort of your friends? I have been to, to funerals where friends would come out by the dozens, maybe even hundreds at times, and, and they're there because they care. Now, to those of you who are the friends, let, let me just make a statement or two about what not to do. When you go to comfort somebody who is experiencing hurt or sorrow in their life for whatever reason, Please don't tell them you know just how they feel. Folks, none of us knows how anyone else feels. So don't, please don't say that. But the best thing to do is just say, I'm so sorry. I'll be praying for you. And sometimes a handshake or just a hug or a pat on the back is sufficient. Actually, if you never say a word, your presence su su suggests concern. And that speaks volumes. But then another thing I would suggest when hurt comes in your life is, why don't you love and be loved? You know, we have a God who's called in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and uh, verses 3 and 4 as the Father of mercies, and He's also called the God of all comfort. The God of all comfort. And then Paul goes on to say, who comforts us in all of our tribulation. And we're able to comfort others in their tribulation with the same comfort wherewith we've been comforted of God. God comforts us, we just pass it on. You see, we need to let, allow others to love us and allow God to love us and to comfort our hearts, and then we pass it on. But let's go back to the text I read just briefly. James 5 and verse 11. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. What is the end, end of the Lord? What was it in Job's life? First of all, he is with us in the midst of suffering. He's with us in the midst of it. He may not remove you from it, but he will be with you in it. I think about the Paul was on a ship bound for Rome, and there was a storm that arose, and, and the sailors on the ship were frightened, and Paul said, Sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be as God has told me. What did God tell you, Paul? He said, we're going to halt Rome with no loss of life. The safest place for Paul to be right there in the middle of that storm was on that boat because God was on that boat with him. And God may not get you out of the furnace of suffering, of hurt, but He'll get in there with you. Another suggestion that we see is that, that God will take the bruises that we have and He'll turn those bruises into blessings. That's exactly what He did in the life of Job. Job, in the end, in chapter 42 and verse 2, received double of, what his, lo of his losses, and He received back ten more children. Ten more children. Whatever happens in our lives, we can be assured 
that God will take the, the hurt in our life and turn it into something good. Because all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. And then another thing that is the, that su comes in the end of suffering, so far as God is concerned, is that he will use us to encourage other people. Because of what we have suffered, we can be an encouragement to other people. Friend, when I think about one who suffered unbelievably, I, not only do I think about Job, but I think about Jesus. Jesus suffered. I've heard people say Jesus suffered, bled, and died upon the cross of Calvary. And I fear that we may hear those expressions so many times that they are, they've almost become meaningless to us. Maybe not meaningless, but we don't feel the emotion about it that we ought. Jesus suffered. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. He died for our sins. I want to encourage you to give your life to him today. He loves you so much that he died for you. And would you not this day as a believer in Jesus would be willing to repent of your sins? To confess that you believe Jesus to be the Son of God? And as a penitent confessing believer be baptized into Jesus because Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I want to thank you for watching Getting to Know Your Bible today. And may I give you an invitation to visit the Church of Christ in your community and until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you, is my prayer. We want to help you as much as possible in your search for a personal relationship with God. You can now easily access our free Bible correspondence course online at gettingtoknowyourbible.org. If there's any way we can help you grow closer to God, please email us at knowyourbible at golftel.com. Or call us anytime at 1-877-711-5214. Getting to Know Your Bible has been presented by Churches of Christ. If you have a question about the church, or if you would like the location of a Church of Christ near you, or to receive the free Bible course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama 36580, or call 1-877-711-5214. Join us next time for Getting to Know Your Bible.